uh, very good evening to all of you a uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen wherever you are greetings and regards from the land of flood jagannath and uh, me and uh, our esteemed uh, guest faculty dr d ramamurthy are here to take you through for the next one and a half hours through a journey that every cataract surgeon is supposed to embark on uh, we all are cataract surgeons and all thanks to the uh, awareness that we have uh, generated successfully in our patients minds over the years we all are reasonably voluminous cataract surgeons by now the only thing that remains uh, for our transition from a, a normal cataract surgeon to a cataract or refractive surgeon is the joy of seeing our patients work away walk away from our opds on the post operative follow up day without any glass prescription at least for distance we have achieved this by and large at least as far as the spherical segment is concerned all thanks to our excellent surgical techniques and the state of the art equipments right from biometry to phaco machines that are available with us but there are a few segments that remain unanswered and one of them is the helix is the helix of astigmatism and here in this particular webinar on this friday evening we would like to decode that helix that is enigmatic called preoperative astigmatism and how to handle it on the table and then on before we proceed further we would like to ask you a few questions two of them uh, basically before we take it any further the first of these uh, poll questions is coming up on your screen right now can we have the first question please uh, yes sir first question the first question would be as you can see on your screens what percentage of patients that attend your clinic in a day to day practice have pre existing astigmatism this is not about cataract patients alone how many patients in general do you see who have a pre existing astigmatism be it refractive errors because that number does extrapolate to the cataract patient population as well so is it more than 10% is it more than 20% as choice b is it more than 30% or is, is it more than 40% please post your answers and we would get the results uh, soon enough what percentage of uh, uh, the patient population do you think have astigmatism uh, when they come to present themselves at the opd and the second question is amongst the poll question the second question is what is your opinion about toric iols what is your opinion about toric iols a are they a necessity or a need for the patient who has a pre existing astigmatism or should it be considered a lifestyle iol which should be reserved for a group of patients this question has relevance in the sense uh, yeah you can go to the chat window and uh, click on the link to answer the questions now this question has relevance from the perspective that at least in a country like india where we all have uh, grown up to uh, be reasonable uh, reasonably voluminous surgeons as far as cataract is concerned the number does not quite extrapolate on to the toric iol so if the number that we see is x the correction in astigmatism we perform is y one of the basic questions that remains in people's minds and it sits is how much to correct if the pre existing astigmatism amounts to 0.5 0.6 should you correct all that would be embedded all those answers will be embedded in the first talk of the evening because we are dealing with very practical aspects and taking home some extremely useful and practical tips from none other than dr d ramamurthy chairman emeritus uh, the i foundation group of hospitals uh, an ophthalmologist uh, uh, par uh, any parallelism drawn an entrepreneur an ex office bearer of all india ophthalmological society in various capacities and uh, a, a, a very immaculate speaker in his capacity dr d ramamurthy speaks on the practical approach to treating astigmatism with the help of toric iols for the next 30 to 40 minutes over to you dr dr and here is your audience 
Let me <coughs> share my screen. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just interrupt you, uh, Dr. Ramurthy, for a second? Uh, while yeah. we are on with our presentations, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, for the uh, participants. You can also shoot your questions in case you have any query to be clarified later on, because we have a sizable amount of time devoted to good question answer session in the end of it. So do uh, please feel free to uh, shoot in your questions. We will try to address them uh, to the best of our capacities. Thank you. Sorry, sir. Please carry on. No problem. My, my slides are seen well. I'm audible. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Anurag, for that uh, view, not just introducing me, but so aptly introducing the subject. I think you did a great job and uh, laid the foundation for today's evening. Uh, thank you, Alcon, as usual, for, for uh, getting this together. I'm sure that uh, many of the uh, uh, <clears throat> delegates who have joined us are themselves eminent surgeons who are day in and day out dealing with astigmatism in cataract surgery. <clears throat> and it would be great to interact with them. And as Anurag pointed out, let's have a good amount of interaction as we go along. My first topic would be, my topic would be optimizing astigmatic outcomes in cataract surgery. And these are my financial disclosures. I'm a consultant for both Alcon and Johnson & Johnson. Some of the products that I'd be alluding to in my talk would, uh, are manufactured by either of these companies. <clears throat> as regards Anurag's first poll question, regarding the prevalence of astigmatism per se, it said at least in the cataract age group, uh, nearly 25% um, of them have more than 1.5 diopters of cylinder. About 10% of them have more than two diopters and rarely it's about three diopters. Obviously, just like we would not prescribe glasses without correcting the cylinder, as cataract surgeons of the third millennium, we owe it to ourselves and our patients to get rid of this corneal cylinder when we do this cataract surgery. Obviously, this would enhance not just the uh, quantity of vision, but also the quality of vision. You may have seen this slide before, and as you can see over here, just a 0.5 diopters of cylinder, which is left behind uncorrected, or a diopter of cylinder, which is left uncorrected, causes a significant deterioration in not just the quality of vision, but not even in the quantity of vision. And obviously, the patient requires some kind of an optical crutches externally, which is what we would like to avoid. So what are the options that are available to us? Toric intraocular lenses, which I'll be covering in greater detail, laser arcuate keratotomies, limbal relaxing incisions, opposite clear corneal incisions, and incision on the steep axis. I'll be actually covering them in the reverse order because that's uh, the way I feel is the order of importance. And I think incision on steep axis, I'm not even going to dwell upon it because as we go along, we'll see that it's hardly relevant because uh, today we consider the, the astigmatism induced by the uh, incision that we make of less than 2.4 millimeters to be extremely small and it really cannot be used as far as correcting astigmatism is concerned. And I've almost for the last half a decade, I've completely given up operating on axis. Earlier, I, I used to make my incision either superiorly or uh, temporally, depending on where the steep axis is, but that's something that I've given up completely. Reasons for that we'll see as we go along. As far as opposite clear corneal incision is concerned, it is a fairly old video of mine because again, it was six, seven years since I did this. You can see at the end of surgery, I'm making an incision of 2.4 millimeter nasally. The, the, you can see the uh, initial incision temporally. It was thought and some even important uh, ophthalmologists like Uday Devgan believe that this corrects almost up to about 0.6 diopters of astigmatism. These pad incisions, the primary incision and the secondary incision, which is made nasally. But that's really not my experience. And I do not think there's enough literature to bear that. And it's important that no instrument passes through your nasal incision. It's not distorted. And this incision almost completely heals up over time. And that's the reason that opposite clear corneal incision you might do it for uh, just for your satisfaction, but factually it does not have any uh, significant impact. As regards limbal relaxing incision is concerned, that's scientific. And this is a limbal relaxing incision that, that is being made again about 70 years back old uh, video. And you can see the initial markings. It's a guarded 600 micron blade that's being used. And it's uh, usually I see, like to see a small bleed. And that tells me that I'm right at the limbus. Basically, it's a bad incision, the length of which is determined by the nomogram, the arc length of which. And essentially, these are something like uh, 
the radial keratotomy incisions it works how much it works how long the effect will last it, it's all quite variable and nowadays of course there is a better more scientific way of doing this i'm sure anurag will be taking you through the very on in greater detail but once i almost gave up uh, limb relaxing incisions completely but once i became comfortable with the very on this is the way i do it as and when i am required to do this if the patient has less than a diopter of astigmatism i want to debulk it this gives me much more precise control over the axis of astigmatism the placement of the incision so using the baryon as a guide or that for that matter any digital imaging device as a guide to is a good way to go but uh, then uh, this is the pad incision you can see over here these are the arcuate incisions over the over here and uh, the initial limb relaxing incisions that have been made and when it came comes to uh, the dimensions of these incisions per se it's basically depending upon uh, you can see even for just about a 0.5 diopters of a cylinder what you get is almost a 22 degrees of arc length that's required this is a kind of a reading that you can get out of your very on and routinely i use this incision in my lensex equipment and essentially to create this kind of incisions and subsequently it's important that i almost always open up these incisions you can see this incision being over the at the end of the surgery these incisions are being open and uh, uh, it's extremely important that intrastomal incisions do not work and whatever little effect that you get is because you when you open this up is only when they work and you can see it's a multifocal intraocular that have been used and it's important to see that the incisions have been made at the 0 180 degrees axis so initially i thought that it would not be a good idea to make this incision in the area of my temporal clear corneal incision but because it's at 8 mm now i find that i'm quite comfortable to make my temporal clear corneal incision and get the benefit of these pyat arcuates which are laser design it's not just the fact that these incisions do not have a uh, significant impact that they tend to regress also it is depend upon depending upon the effect depends upon the primary corneal rigidity that's the reason the younger patients whose corneas are more elastic the effect is a little less compared to older patients and there's a wide variation in the degree of uh, elasticity in the uh, patients that we deal with and that's the reason that these incisions are not always predictable whatever little effect they have also tend to vanish with time so essentially the limb relaxing incision the laser arcuate keratotomy is a good way and in case you are dealing with small amounts of astigmatism with a spherical intraocular lens or a multifocal intraocular lens it's a uh, it's an add on that you could give to deepen the amount of astigmatism but in case it's a uh, against the rule astigmatism of 0.75 octopters or more or with the rule astigmatism of 1.25 octopters or more it's a good idea to resort to something better and this you can see is a uh, arcuate keratotomy incision laser arcuate keratotomy incisions that have been made using the laser the first day post operative picture and obviously this does have an impact and because the machine is available with you if you are doing using an elasis platform it is always a good idea to use it and with the very own guidance which works on the already two principle uh, incorporated in it you get fairly good prediction as to where exactly you need to make these incisions and now we had the barrett two calculator uh, calculator also incorporated in it i am sure anurag will be covering it in great detail so why am i so uh, uh, somewhat uh, tending to go towards the laser arcuate keratotomy because it's image guided it's precise and uniform i am exactly able to make the incision where i want and the depth of the incision the length of the incision the arc length of the incision the position of the incision is well under my control do i have not done it myself most of often i open up the incisions on the table it itself because i believe these incisions do not have any significant impact they are not open but uh, it is also suggested that depending upon the post operative astigmatism the opening of these incisions can be titrated uh, on the slit lamp so that you get uh, as an effect depending upon what you need but i do believe that uh, it, these incisions are not so precise basically there is an approximation that you get and so as far as treatment options for astigmatism is concerned what we have covered is glasses and contacts obviously this is patient dependent it's a lifestyle issues are there again there is an ongoing expense if you have to go for a, um, with a cylindrical correction um, a good quality 
progressive lenses, they are quite expensive. And if a patient gets operated with the non-toric lens at the age of 55 or 60, for the next 20, 25 years, if he's going to be spending on uh, uh, progressive lenses with cylindrical power incorporated in it, the expense might be much more than what he would have initially spent on a toric intraocular lens implant. Secondly, when it comes to incision, we have already seen the various modalities that are available to us, but there is lack of precision, lack of predictability, they tend to regress, and basically they are bent for uh, amounts of astigmatism in the range of about 0.75 to 1 diopter. Doing an additional laser is, of course, a choice that is there. Most of us have access to a laser refractive suit, but obviously it's an additional procedure. And when you do um, um, uh, a PRK procedure, the kind of irritation, discomfort that comes on with these patients is not something that's acceptable to these patients. If you create a flap and do under that for a small amounts of refractive error, that again, um, issues about uh, ocular surface, etc., come may come up in these elderly individuals. And most often, a secondary procedure is not something that's welcome. So essentially, what we are going to be talking in the rest of the, my presentation is about toric and talk lenses. And I believe in those 25% of the cases where the astigmatism was significant, and these are the patients who definitely need toric and talk lenses. In countries like uh, Australia, where essentially reimbursement for toric and talk lenses is completely covered, even 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopters of astigmatism is dealt with as a toric and talk lenses. On uptake of toric and talk lenses, some practices at the range of about 80, 85%. So just like you would not prescribe glasses without correcting even 0.5 diopters of cylinder, maybe as we go along in our professional lifetime, we'll see that toric and toric lens becomes a norm and not the uh, not an exception. Where exactly you would use these toric and toric lenses? Basically, whenever the toricity is orthogonal, that is in this case where the steep and the flat axis at 90 degrees to each other, that's exactly where you'd use a toric and toric lens. But in a case where there is a corneal scar, where there's a, uh, already a keratoconus situation like this, or there is a, um, uh, there is a post radial keratotomy situation where the toricity is not regular on the corneal surface, maybe it's not a good idea to use these lenses. Suffice it to say, if the coning is not centered, if it's progressive, then maybe it's not a good idea to use these toric lenses. Another tip would be, if the patient had good quality vision, was satisfied with the uh, quality of vision that the patient uh, had or good correction with these glasses uh, before the onset of cataract, then maybe toric and toric lenses would serve him well. But in case the patient required a contact lens as a hard lens or a semi-soft or a specified lens like a rose K toric lens for the correction of the astigmatism on the corneal surface, then the toric and toric lens may not be sufficient. And in case you're using a toric and toric lens in these cases, you have to pre-warn these patients that uh, subsequent correction or with contact lenses may be necessary because the intraocular lens that you do does not regularize the corneal surface. So if the cylinder is stable, if the cylinder is well-centered, even in case there is a, somewhat of an irregular cornea, you can go ahead and use it. Um, so telling the patient, that the correction may not be absolute or accurate, but essentially we are debulking the amount of uh, astigmatism that the patient has to do with. Another important factor that most of you will already be aware of is that the refractive astigmatism or the astigmatism in the glasses does not uh, play an important aspect, though you will have a look at it. It's essentially because as you can see in these eye trace uh, pictures, it's not that you need an eye trace essentially to go ahead and start in, incorporating toric and toric lens in your practice. But just to make this evident, you can see in this situation that uh, the, this is the lenticular astigmatism, this is the corneal astigmatism, almost the entire, this is the total astigmatism in the eye. Almost the total astigmatism is from the lens, which is going to be removed in the cataract surgical process. And the cornea is quite pristine. So even though the patient might have worn uh, glasses, something like a minus 1.5 diopters of cylinder in his or her glasses right through their life because of the corneal astigmatism being so minimal, this is the patient who may not require a uh, toric intraocular lens. On the other hand, look at a situation like this where the uh, internal astigmatism and the, um, the corneal astig anterior corneal astigmatism 
tend to neutralize each other so that the total amount of astigmatism is almost zero. The patient might have never worn uh, cylindrical glasses, but you can see the amount of astigmatism in the cornea is quite significant, almost 1.18 diopters uh, with the rule astigmatism. So obviously a toric intraocular lens may be a consideration. So basically, yeah, just because the patient has not been wearing cylindrical correction in his or her glasses, that does not mean the patient does not require a toric correction in the intraocular lenses. I believe the results of my uh, toric intraocular lenses have significantly improved. And also my understanding of the uh, very concept that they use preoperatively has changed completely in the last half a decade or so. Because of these three major issues, which I'll be alluding to, that's the issue of posterior corneal astigmatism, surgically induced astigmatism, and the toricity ratio. Basically, the posterior cornea was something which we could not see, we could not measure, we did not understand. Till such time as the seminal article from Doc Cockes and group came up, published in JCRS, and he covered it more eloquently in his uh, Binkos lecture. And that's when we all woke up to the fact that posterior corneal astigmatism is something which could deteriorate the quality of outcomes with our uh, toric and troc lens. So that, that's something that needs to be considered seriously. 80 to 90 percent of the uh, posterior corneal astigmatism will be against the rule and the relationship will be such that it be more in the range of about 0.5 diopters. If in case the anterior cornea has with the rule astigmatism, it will be about 0.3 diopters or so uh, against, uh, against the rule if the uh, anterior cornea has against the rule astigmatism. So basically, this is going to increase the amount of against the rule astigmatism that the patient has to deal with and reduce the amount of astigmatism that the uh, patient has to deal with if it's with the rule astigmatism on the anterior cornea. Another important thing is the posterior corneal astigmatism is something that does not change with the age of the patient, but remains constant right through. As far as the anterior corneal astigmatism is concerned, especially if you're talk talking about pediatric cataracts or juvenile cataracts with significant amount of uh, uh, corneal astigmatism, you need to remember that this astigmatism tends to shift over uh, the lifetime of the patient. That's the reason most often our laser refractive correction patients have with the rule astigmatism because they are in the 20s and 30s. Gradually, it tends to uh, go from with the rule astigmatism to against the rule astigmatism at the rate of about three eighths of a doctor for every DK. That's the reason in case the patient has with the rule astigmatism and you are operating on a cataract at the age of 30 or so, for minimal amounts of astigmatism in the uh, range of about 1, 1.25 diopters, I would not even consider a toric and troc lens because it might also be partly taken over, taken care of by the against the rule astigmatism in the posterior cornea. And this is what exactly this uh, slide says. So in case the young patient has against the rule astigmatism, you will tend to treat it quite aggressively. But if it's with the rule astigmatism, maybe you go easy on correcting the astigmatism. The next aspect I would like to cover is the, uh, the toricity ratio. Basically, the intraocular lens plane, if you have about 1.5 diopters, it will correct about one diopter at the corneal plane. But this is for the average eyes. When it comes to highly hypropic eyes, when the intraocular lens is placed quite anteriorly, the eyeball is quite small, it's in the range of about 1.2 diopters in the intraocular lens that you require to correct one diopter uh, in the corneal plane. When it comes to very myopic eyes where the intraocular lens is going to be, the ELP is going to be quite poor, uh, at the back of the eye, it's going to be 1.75 diopters for every diopter of correction. And as you can see the, in this chart over here, when we are dealing with a corneal power about 38 diopters in the cornea and an axial length of about 20 millimeters, which is a highly hypropic eye, you need all, just about 1.29 diopters in the lens to correct one diopter uh, on the corneal plane. But when you're talking about a long eye with a steep cornea, you require almost 1.86 diopters in the uh, intraocular lens plane to correct just about one diopter. So obviously, this is something that needs to be considered. The fact that it's 1.5 diopters in the uh, IOL plane with correct one, one diopter in the corneal plane does not hold good. The next factor is the centroid, the, uh, the surgically induced astigmatism. I already mentioned that I do not believe in the concept of on axis uh, incisions. Also, I do not believe in the concept of OCCI. It's because initially I used to use the Warren Hill formula 
create um, uh, basically measure the kind of astigmatism that my incisions were creating and i arrived at the fact that my 2.4 mm clear corneal incision temporal clear corneal incision created about 0.4 diopters of astigmatism that's what i was feeding into my toric calculators for a long time till this concept of you know, centroid astigmatism came up we have to when we are talking about earlier in times when you had used to talk about surgically induced astigmatism we used to consider only the magnitude of the astigmatism and the fact remains that the astigmatism in different areas of the cornea has both a magnitude as well as a direction and when you consider both the direction and magnitude in a double angle plot like this where they tend to neutralize each other a well constructed sub 2.4 mm clear corneal incision temporal clear corneal incision just creates about a average centroid value of 0.1 diopters so that's the reason we have given up this on axis incisions and this is the 0.1 diopter is what you feed into your uh, astigmatic calculators of course it's possible to customize it to again go to the warren hill website and look at the centroid uh, value for your individual incisions by feeding up values for about 30 odd patients both the preoperative and post operative outcomes but then it's i do not think it's really necessary because most often it's in the range of 0.11 to diopters as far as the formula for uh, uh, intraocular lens form power calculation is concerned i would like to keep it simple there are numerous formulae available and they are uh, all of them have excellent benefits but for me the one single go to not only for toric intraocular lenses but all my intraocular lens uh, calculations today is barrett suit and that is what i uh, um, all my centers nine centers across different parts of south india all, all over whether we have the optical biometer or not we resort to this and consistently we are getting good outcomes i would say that the barrett universal two formula for our spherical lenses for toric intraocular lenses the barrett toric calculator post refractive surgery the barrett true k formula in case there is a residual cylinder uh, after toric intraocular lens uh, implantation the barrett rx formula and in case you want to do a toric uh, uh, intraocular lens implantation after refractive surgery whether after radial keratotomy or after laser vision correction you could use a barrett true k toric calculator as i said there are multiple other formulae available but this significant study showed that when you are aiming at a residual cylindrical error of less than 0.5 diopters in this comparative study it uh, 75% of the eyes when uh, the barrett toric calculator was used uh, basically it uh, landed up with less than 0.5 diopters of residual astigmatism is not to say that uh, there are other excellent formula like the hill rbf uh, abulafia formula etc but instead of going ahead with uh, talking about multiple options i would like to leave behind the take home message that most of us the barrett true k formula and the barrett universal formula will serve us quite well and where is it available when you have access to uh, optical biometers like the iol master 700 the lensstar 900 the and the varion and the top one aladdin and some of the other biometers these are incorporated in some of these machines and not only the fact that these uh, formula are incorporated but the fact is these are also able to measure the axial length very accurately and the keratometry readings that uh, these uh, instruments give you are extremely pristine obviously are advantages when it comes to intraocular lens power calculation but what if you do not have access to it the both the acrs and the apacrs websites have this drop down menu where you can access all this for that matter uh, the barrett rx formula as well as the barrett uh, uh, 2k toric calculator are not available on these biometers but that's something that you can access in these instruments so even if you do a routine immersion a scan please give up contact a scan and a good um, um, manual bio, uh, manual keratometry you can still have the benefit of these formula just make sure that your readings are repeatable the axis of uh, measurement of your toricity should be within 5 degrees and as far as the uh, magnitude is concerned it should be within 0.1 diopters if you get that kind of readings in your uh, axis measurement as far as your cylindrical measurements is concerned you can go ahead and enjoy the benefits of this formula even in case you do not have access to optical biometers of course if you are a high volume surgeon if you are into premium intraocular lenses 
um, investing in one of these optical biometers is a good idea because it's something that would uh, uh, improve the outcomes for your monofocals, for your multifocals, for your toric and trough lenses. And just in case I uh, do not go away with the, the uh, feeling that you have to understand completely all this concept of toricity ratio, uh, the uh, SIA, etc. Because most of the uh, commercial good toric calculators have it incorporated in them. Like the Alcon toric calculator is uh, Alcon toric, uh, Barrett toric calculator. You can see the axial length is just something that's incorporated in this. You have to incorporate the AC depth. The basic intraocular lens power has to be incorporated. They, they, once you incorporate that, the toricity ratio is automatically taken into account because depending upon whether it's a 30 diopter lens or whether it's a 10 diopter lens, the amount of cylinder that needs to be incorporated in the lens is taken into account. Then you can see the surgically induced astigmatism that I'm feeding in for is just 0 0.10. Even you do not have to calculate this in case you are making a um, Temporal clear corneal incision of uh, less than 2.5 millimeters. This is something you can go with. If it's 2.8 to 3 millimeters, maybe you can increase it to 0 0.25 uh, for a clear uh, temporal incision. And K index is something 1.3375. It's what is most often. But some keratometers use a different index. You can get this from your manufacturers. When you introduce these concepts, the, uh, the quality of outcomes is going to be much, uh, uh, much better. Five to six years back, it was basically what we are using was a legacy toric calculator when you used to supply this information for the toric calculation to Alcon. And nowadays they are using the Barrett toric calculator. When you initially switched over, just for my understanding whether it makes a difference, you can see for the same subset of patients, I have uh, had these measurements. You can see the changeover from T4 to T6 to T4, from T4 to C T6, a significant change in the axis. And obviously, even if you are using endrin toric intraocular lenses, several some of the other uh, toric intraocular lenses apart from Alcon, it's important you do the right kind of calculation. Basically, if you're using the manufacturer's toric uh, calculators, do understand whether they are, they are taking into consideration posterior corneal astigmatism, toricity ratio, etc. Otherwise, it might be a good idea for you to go ahead and access the APA CRS at the ACRS website. Do your own toric calculations, which are extremely simple. Once you have done, done a few cases and let the uh, company know what exactly is the quality, the uh, dimensions, the lens that you need. So what exactly is special about the Barrett toric calculator, the Alcon toric calculator? It incorporates posterior corneal astigmatism. It, it takes into consideration the against the rule uh, drift that occurs with age. The targets about 0.25 diopters, 0.5 diopters of with the rule astigmatism because that's compensated with the aging of the patient. It takes into consideration the axial length and the intraocular lens spherical power. The centroid value of induced astigmatism is something that you can feed in. K index is something again that you can feed in depending upon the biometer that you can uh, use it. For the sake of completion, uh, as far as the uh, uh, toricity uh, measurement is concerned, now we have, when you are talking about the Barrett toric calculator, it's a mathematically derived um, posterior corneal. Uh, uh, sphericity that's that's taken into consideration. But in, now you have the advantage of exactly measuring this when you use a IOL Master 700, which is based upon the Swept OCT principle and uses the telecentric keratometry. Because of uh, the accurate measurement of the corneal thickness based upon the anterior corneal uh, curvature, it extrapolates the posterior corneal curvature accurately. So you get actually the get the both the anterior corneal curvature and the posterior corneal curvature is measured, is measured and is fed into the formula. And that's when you talk about the Barrett uh, uh, toric TK or the Barrett universal TK formula. And this obviously adds another dimension to accuracy because here the toricity is not mathematically derived. The posterior corneal uh, uh, cylinder is not mathematically derived, but it is something which is calculated. And this instrument is obviously quite accurate. But as far as outcomes are concerned, there's one paper which has come out, which has compared uh, the outcomes with the Barrett uh, toric calculator and the Barrett, K, uh, uh, um, uh, the Barrett TK calculator. It shows that there is a somewhat of an improvement where you see that, uh, uh, which is not statistically significant, but it is there. 
we have actually given it to one of our uh, uh, dnb students as a, a thesis to derive this but as far as the initial experience is concerned um, it's uh, i i feel even though the tk calculator is a significant advancement the basic calculation that you get with your barrett calculator is quite comparable and in just in case you do not have the tk software you would still end up getting accurate um, uh, measurements as far as you using the right formula and this is just a by the way slide to give you an interesting way of uh, in the clinic quickly calculating what is the amount of cylindrical correction at the corneal plane that your intraocular lens will give if you are in plan what will be the number t5 t3 t2 just subtract 1 from that and divide it by 2 this is 6 t6 minus 1 t5 divided by 2 so you get a 2.5 diopters of correction at the corneal plane if it is t8 it's t8 minus 1 7 by 2 it gives you 3.5 diopters and you can see when the, the, for an average eye if the relationship at the iol plane the corneal plane is 1.5 diopters uh, but uh, we have already seen that based upon the toricity ratio this can change but when i uh, mentally want to make a calculation as to what exactly is the kind of power that this patient is going to require but when i see the chart i just make a quick calculation as to whether these two match up as far as coming on to the what we do on the uh, table and uh, uh, just before the surgery uh, basically um, the phaco emulsification part is something i'm just not going to deal with uh, it's uh, given that you do an excellent surgery get a good rexes Uh, etc which will uh, rapidly cover uh, pre operative marking is something which is extremely important the very fact that the multiple modalities available to you tells you that none of them are perfect free hand marking is something i saw david chang doing in his clinic he claims excellent results in his hand it works quite well we have also tried that obviously it's a smudge that's there left over there it's not a great way to go you can see this bubble marker as far as you hold it parallel to the ground with the patient sitting up with the air bubble right in the center you get these 3 o'clock 9 o'clock and 6 o'clock uh, meridian markings and it also works quite well another great way of uh, doing a pre operative marking is obviously with the, before the you dilate the pupil constrict the beam of light let it bisect the pupil uh, in a half and then mark both at the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock meridian it said that you could just create a small subcranial hemorrhage but sometimes that tends to disappear so what i uh, like to create is a small scratch over here and because the cornea is anesthetized the patient doesn't feel anything that's something that would serve you quite well on the table but the uh, the best way to go is to uh, uh, use some kind of a digital marker which uh, anurag will be covering uh, adequately later on and uh, this obviously allows you to not to have this um, problem of pre operative marking and also uh, takes into automatic consideration about the um, the, the whatever uh, uh, cyclotorsion component that is there in this particular right when i have to do a pre operative marking that's what i used to do about 6 years back it's with the patient inclined lying uh, inclined to the uh, the uh, wall with the torch held uh, held at the level of the eye and that's a bubble marker that i use Uh, marking at the three nine o'clock and six o'clock meridian. There's a slightly old video, and uh, mind you, it's not that you need a digital marking device before you can go on to toric and trochlear lenses. You can get excellent outcomes once you adhere to certain principles. This is the kind of uh, marking that's done on the table for to show you. Basically, this uh, patient required the orientation of the intraocular lens at the zero one eighty degree meridian. That's a two point two millimeter incision being made. Nowadays, I've shifted over to two point four millimeter incision because I want no distortion of my uh, incision. And the amount of uh, centroid value of the toricity induced by two point two or a two point four millimeter incision is nearly the same. The that's the um uh, the uh, iq toric being introduced with a stable force haptics which ensures that the lens remains exactly where you leave it uh, the pupil has come down a bit nevertheless it's possible to align the lens quite adequately you can see me that uh, you can see me aligning the lens both uh, in the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock axis the capsular rexes that has been made is quite adequate and uh, it's important that there is uh, the overlap that is achieved 
is quite uniform. Two smaller X's and two larger X's is also not good. What I aim is a, about 5 to 5.5 millimeters. And as far as we are able to do a gentle FIFCO emulsification without uh, disrupting the capsule or bag in any way, the results are quite good. I'd be alluding some other factors also that needs to be kept in mind. And uh, uh, I almost uh, nowadays routinely use all my cataract surgery with the Varion overlay. It's not just the alignment of the uh, toric axis, the very positioning of my incision, which is usually about 70 degrees away from my primary incision, the positioning of my uh, primary incision, the capsular rexes, because I usually aim at a 5 millimeter, 5.5 millimeter rexes. And what I have, uh, you can see that the overlay will come on. And this is the location of the incisions. Uh, you can see the incision being made at 30 degrees here, but routinely nowadays I make it at 30, uh, zero degrees. And because I do not want any kind of capsular contraction, I uh, polished my uh, back of my uh, anterior capsular rim in these cases. And uh, it's important that uh, the kind of rotation that you need these lenses should be only in the anti-clockwise direction. And uh, it's a, uh, viscoelastic should be adequately removed both from front of the lens and as far as the back of the lens. And it's important that you do not overfill the, these uh, capsular bags. And you can see the uh, lens is reasonably well aligned. When you have this digital marking device available to you, obviously the kind of accuracy that you can derive is significantly better. In spite of all the advances that we have in hand today, sometimes, sometimes you have a, a refractive surprise. In these cases, you can use a Barrett RX formula, which is again, which is available you might have to do an IOL rotation, which is most often required. You may have to do an IOL exchange and sometimes a piggyback intraocular lens. And all this is given to you by the Barrett RX formula. And when do you do uh, go ahead and do a rotation of the intraocular lens? When the spherical equivalent of the uh, residual astigmatism is almost zero, because when you rotate the lens, you are not increasing the spherical or the cylindrical power, but you are just redistributing the power. You can see this is the power that is implanted. This is what I see in the post-operative period at the end of one week. It's usually a good idea to rotate these lenses if it's required at about two weeks uh, time. And you see it's about minus 1.25 is the spherical equivalent of the cylinder. And it's, it almost matches the spherical error that's there. This is when rotation of this lens would uh, do well. And the amount of rotation that's needed is given by this RX formula. Uh, sorry. And this is, you can see, uh, it has to be rotated from six degrees to 176 degrees. And in case uh, it's something which is very simple to do, we'll see a short video on that. In case it's just a cylindrical error that's left over or a significant spherical error that's over, left over, it's not, uh, rotation of the lens is not going to help you. In these cases, it's important to exchange the lens. And that's again, something that can be given, given to you by uh, Barrett RX formula. And in case you want to deal with it by piggybacking a lens, because the lens is already there for quite some time, the patient is very finicky. You don't want to go ahead and uh, do a, something on the corneal surface using the laser. Again, you can get the power of the piggyback lens that needs to be implanted. Mind you, you do not need an optical biometer to get these readings. Once you do a perfect biometry, have calculated the residual error quite completely using the ASCRS or APACRS websites with using the drop-down menu you can calculate how to go ahead and correct these, uh, the residual astigmatism. Uh, this is before I had the Varion with me. All you need to do is to, this is essentially required about 10 degree of rotation. This is an Indian toric lens in which is there. And uh, all, there's no viscoelastic that's used. Basically all I use is do is a irrigation cannula inside and gently rotate the lens. It's just about a two minute procedure. And you can see this was the pre-rotation pre position of the lens. And this is post-rotation. This is good overlap of the rexes. Let's see using the Varion. In this case, obviously there was a rexes runoff and maybe that's the reason this is a toric IQ that has been implanted. It's going to be difficult to uh, retain this lens, but because there was significant amount of astigmatism, I went ahead and rotated this lens. This is with the Varion overlay. You can see this is the position of the lens. This is where the final position of the lens is going to be. No viscoelastic is introduced. With just the irrigation cannula in place, you can gently rotate these lenses. And uh, uh, it's important that you 
offer this kind of a rotation because every one degree of rotation is going to um, reduce the effect of uh, the toricity by three three percentage. And if there is a 10 degree rotation, is almost 30 percent of the effect is gone. When you use high end technology like this, it's you owe it to your patients to leave them behind with least amount of uh, astigmatism. Uh, that's uh, you can see that's a fairly good position that we have achieved. Let's just very quickly run through some examples. Uh, Preoperatively, why is it important that even a 0.87 diopters against the rule needs to be dealt with? You can see this patient actually went ahead and received a LRCF with a panoptics, and but he ended it with 618 uncorrected visual acuity. Had this kind of astigmatism, residual astigmatism left over, this could have easily been dealt with with the uh, um, toric panoptics. Uh, this was uh, done in the beginning of 2019 when toric panoptics was just coming into the market. And uh, the patient was extremely unhappy with the outcome. But he was understanding, he had trust in me. And I said that we will wait for three months, I'll deal with it with, using a laser on the cornea. But while waiting, would you like to get the second eye done? And he uh, agreed to go ahead and do it. And you can see the second eye almost had exactly the same amount uh, of a cylinder, 0 0.86 di diopters at 180 degrees. And he required a T3 toric uh, panoptics. And that's exactly what was implanted. And you can uh, see that uh, in this eye, the second eye in the left eye, he ended up requiring uh, no correction for distance, intermediate, and near. And now I've gone ahead and corrected the astigmatism that was left behind on the cornea. And now he's a happy patient. So the point I want to say is that not, especially when you're doing multifocals, trifocals, it's important you deal with astigmatism quite completely. For cost reasons, if you leave behind astigmatism, then even small amounts of astigmatism can uh, lead to a very uh, unsatisfied patient. What about a situation like this? Against the rule of astigmatism and with the rule of astigmatism are two completely different animals. Just about a 0.98 diopters of astigmatism against the rule what is required is a T4 uh, intraocular lens. And obviously, I would go ahead and use this, whether it's a multifocal or a monofocal. On the other hand, you see a 0.75 diopters of toricity uh, uh, with the rule. There's a no uh, non-toric intraocular lens is what is required. Nowadays, our very approach to our biometry has completely changed. Even before counseling is done, the patient undergoes an IOL master study. And based upon the outcome, even my counselor knows whether he requires, the patient requires a toric intraocular lens or non-toric intraocular lens. The whole counseling is done based upon that. Because if you do counsel the patient and later do the biometry, if subsequently you find that there is a significant cylinder that's there, you might have to re-counsel the patient, which becomes a little messy. So doing a good biometry, even before the cornea has been traumatized, is a good idea. And then you could go ahead and deal with it. And again, it's not just uh, uh, the toricity that needs to be neutralized. In this case, a significant amount of toric and uh, toricity. I went ahead and put in a 375 symphony toric. The cylinder was completely taken care of. The patient was unhappy because there was a, uh, a need for near vision glasses. The second eye, I, mind you, I have used uh, the symphony quite often and I believe it's a good lens, but uh, it's uh, somewhat inadequate for near vision. I, the second I implanted a panoptics T6 and uh, with this, because of the trifocality, the patient, is, uh, not only the cylinder got neutralized, but patient uh, enjoyed good, excellent intermediate near and distant vision. So bilaterally implanted, the patient was quite happy. This is one of the major reasons that I do not do uh, simultaneous bilateral uh, cataract surgery, but do sequential surgery. Because based upon the refractive outcome in the second eye, I'm able to titrate the kind of power that I'm planting in the first time. When you are not using a uh, toric lens, it's just about a 0.5 diopters of astigmatism, my variant tells me that I need arc weight incisions of uh, uh, 22 degrees each, uh, even because it's, uh, it's 0.5 diopters of, uh, against the rule astigmatism. But in this case, when it's with the rule astigmatism of 0.81 diopters, uh, I'm not planning on a, a toric intraocular lens, but no arcs are required. So obviously you have to understand that it's not just the magnitude of astigmatism, but the axis is also extremely important, whether you are talking about arc weight keratotomies or you are talking about implanting toric intraocular lenses. Finally, coming to, a tip, uh, to my final take-home messages, 
multiple measurements of K readings, especially if you are doing a manual keratometry. Uh, consider, but do, do not be guided by refractive cylinder. Make sure your ocular surface is pristine and do the measurements even before you uh, do a tonometry or gonioscopy, etc. Enter the measurements immediately so that there is no transcription errors. This surgically induced astigmatism that you are going to use is 0.1. Undercorrect with the rule, overcorrect against the rule, but that's taken care of automatically by your directory calculator. If you are marking, use a fine tip marker, marker. Check the marks once you have made it. Mark before, if in, just in case you are blocking. Most often, I think topical anesthesia we do. Avoid excessive washing because the mark should not be lost. That's the reason using a, a small nick with a um, 26 gauge needle might be a good idea. Uh, and of course, if the Barrett, uh, the axis, uh, the, it should be turned upside down and that's something we do routinely. Uh, on the table, use a little longer incision so that the incisions are quite stable. Avoid over inflating because uh, uh, if there is fluid behind the intraocular lens, whether it is flu uh, whether it's saline or whether it's BSS or whether it's visco, the, the uh, lens will tend to rotate. Nudge the intraocular lens onto the PC. It has also been seen that most of the rotation occurs within the first one hour of the surgery. That's the reason today, even though I do topical clear corneal phaco, I patch the eyes um, immediately after the toric implantation. But I, when I see them down before uh, sending the patient home, I remove this patch while for my non toric implantation, they, they don't receive any patch. Do a slightly small rexis and so that the lens is held in place. Ensure this, uh, that the IOL is in place even after the speculum is off. If residual astigmatism is there, you can use a Barrett RX formula and rotate the lens. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Sorry if I overran, but I thought I'd make it a comprehensive presentation. Not at all, sir. Not at all. That was uh, extensive, that was expansive, that was exhaustive, but at the same time, it was very, very informative indeed for all the respondents, I'm sure, and then some. Uh, now, you would be very happy to learn this, that, uh, that amongst the first uh, two poll questions that we had asked the audience, 75% of the respondents say that more than 30% of their patient population has a pre-existing astigmatism, which is right, which is close to the figures that we see. And an equal number of respondents, more than 75% of the respondents also believe that Torical should be the choice whenever somebody needs it. It should not be considered a lifestyle. I think you mentioned Australia. I think it should also be adopted as a strategy in a country like India. Now, uh, the talk uh, uh, and the duration that you took for the lecture is not at all important, sir. In fact, there is a suggestion in the chat box to put it up uh, from, uh, I think, Dr. Ravi, uh, uh, that you should put it up uh, in the YouTube channel that you have from uh, the I Foundation. and. Uh, uh, so that everybody gets to see uh, the lecture later on, even if somebody has missed it. There was a question, we'll take a, a few right now, because the uh, discussion is very fresh. I think you, in the course of your discussion, you answered this question already. There's, this is from Dr. Jan Sarvate, and he wants to know that there has been a refractive surprise in one of his patients. It's a situation that he has quoted uh, for a panoptic historic IOL that he had put in, and he is left with a minus one cylinder. Uh, in whatever axis. So the aisle is well centered, he says, and the uh, he it is sitting in the desired axis. I think you have already answered that only cylinder, if it's left over, it is usually not due to malalignment. It is due to something else that you have to go back and cross check. But he wants to know what should he be doing now? Uh, actually, as you also mentioned, you know, if it's a pure sphere or a cylinder, uh, usually rotation of these lenses do not uh, work too well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, if I see something on the first post-operative day and I find that there is a significant cylinder and the lens is very much off axis, then I would just go ahead and put the lens back into its original position. But if the, it has been there for some time and it's just a pure minus one diopter cylinder that's left over, you can still go to the astigmatismfix.com or uh, the Barrett, uh, Barrett RX formula and see whether there's a significant duration, uh, rotation that is offered. Most often, it will not be the case. In these cases, since he says it's just a minus one diopter, the uh, bilaterally implanted, if the patient is willing to adapt to it, it might be a good idea to leave it behind. I know Dr. Jain Sarvate has uh, access to a laser. I would uh, suggest that he wait for a period of about three to four months and handle it on the corneal surface. 
uh, which leads us to the uh, other question that comes from Dr. Mansi Desai, and she wants to know whether or not you would leave some amount of astigmatism uncorrected just to increase the depth of focus, like a 0.5. See, would it help? Basically, that's what I was saying. If it is with the rule astigmatism, generally there is a thought process that, you know, especially if the patient is young, leave behind about 0 0.25, 0 0.5 diopters of astigmatism uncorrected. But I think you are just trying to steal some kind of a near vision, which is not really uh, good. And nowadays, I would like to correct, if I'm using a toric lens, I would like to uh, aim uh, on accurate uh, correction. Of course, if it's a Pediatric patient with a significant amount of with the rule astigmatism, I might say I am operating at the age of 10, 15, 20, I might leave behind about 0.5 diopters uncorrected. But otherwise, I will uh, uh, aim at using the lens which leaves behind the minimum amount of astigmatism. This brings us also onto the question of flipping the axis. Usually earlier it used to be thought that if you have started with against the rule astigmatism, if you are leaving the behind with some amount of astigmatism, let it be against the rule astigmatism and uh, uh, choose your lens accordingly. Now, even that uh, concept I've changed. Today, I will select a lens which leaves behind the minimum amount of astigmatism. I might have started with uh, 1.5 diopters of astigmatism in uh, 180 degrees. My lens might leave the patient behind with 0.1 diopters of astigmatism with the rule, but I'll still go ahead and choose that lens. So I, uh, my premise would be to correct astigmatism as completely as possible. Uh, which uh, takes us to the other question that uh, uh, somebody has asked. Of course, it's a little out of the context for the moment because historicals, we normally don't uh, need to see that. But still, it's a question from Dr. Girish Reddy and he wants to know whether or not you look at angle kappa and, of course, angle alpha in all your premium surgeries. Good. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, you know, this is something which is more relevant for the multifocal intraocular lenses. Uh, in, uh, of course, if you have a uh, more than angle kappa, kappa is angle alpha, which is more important. And generally, whenever it's more than 0 0.8, when we do an eye trace for all of our premium intraocular lens patients, whenever it's more than 0 0.8 millimeters, 0 0.5 is what is said. But I, be, I find that, you know, there are quite a few patients who have above 0.5 and even with the multifocal intraocular lens, even with the trifocal intraocular lens, they're quite happy. So there are more features to be considered. But uh, I would stay away from a multifocal intraocular lens or a multifocal toric in case the angle kappa alpha is more than 0.8 millimeters. As far as toric intraocular lenses is concerned, if the, it's not a decentered cone, if it's a patient has been having good vision with his glasses and it's a fairly orthogonal astigmatism, I'll go ahead and use it irrespective of the angle alpha. We come to question number three in our poll. Ladies and gentlemen, Rahul, Mr. Rahul, can we put it up on the screen, please? Question number three in the poll for the audience is, what is the most important factor? I think Dr. Ramurthy has already talked about it extensively and it was all about planning. So what is the most important factor as for you to get the best outcome with Toric IOLs? I think the question, the answer is pretty easy after this extensive talk. Is it preoperative planning and workup? Is it intraoperative axis marking and IL alignment? And is it rotational stability of toric IL being implanted? So there comes the make, the manufacturing, the model, the material, all combined. Do we have, do we have, look at the track record of a particular IL that we implant? I think uh, the answer, uh, it would be difficult for the respondents to answer it as A, B, or C. It could be a combination of all three. But sir, it, it uh, actually leads us to a very valid discussion. I think uh, many people shy away from uh, routinely implanting uh, toric IOLs because of the cost issue, and it's definitely a tax on the pocket of our patients. So uh, do we see a change in, in the attitude of the consultants as well? I mean, should we zero in on products which are relatively cheaper and achieve the same visual results as some of the other IOLs in the market, which have excellent track record for back then, like some of the Indian products. Can we bank on them to produce the same or similar results for us? What's your experience? Very valid practical question you have asked, Anurag. And I believe that, you know, uh, we as ophthalmologists are spoiled for choice today. In the sense that we have so many options today, we can pick and choose what's best for the patient not just is depending on what their eye condition is or what is their, you know, what they can afford also. So I believe that correcting cylinders, especially using a hydrophobic acrylic is the way to go. 
if the patient can afford it using one of the standard intraocular lenses like the Alcon Toric would be a great way to go. That's my lens of my choice. But then at the same time, if the patient cannot afford it because the package rate is high, and has to choose between a hydrophobic acrylic Indian made lens with the toricity incorporated in it and a, a non toric lens, I would go ahead and uh, do not, would not hesitate to go ahead and implant a, a toric Indian uh, uh, hydrophobic intraocular lens. Actually, our package for the uh, non toric uh, imported segment and the toric in, uh, hydrophobic segment is nearly the same. So, when the patient has significant cylinder versus has cost issues, we actually encourage them to go ahead and go ahead with a toric intra lens. I know that it's an Alcon platform, but uh, this is what we do. And uh, mind you, even if they are going for an Indian uh, toric lens, all the features that we, all the things that I talked about as far as the preoperative workup, the surgical steps are exactly the same. And quite often you uh, end up with good results. But one important thing that you need to keep in mind, you, I think since it came up, I must mention this, is the stability of these post-operative stability of these intraocular lenses is extremely important. That way, the uh, Alcon Toric has an excellent track record. Just in 2018, there was an, a, a wonderful publication from uh, David Chang in ophthalmology where he talks about the fact that, you know, uh, the rotation of the IQ, the um, technist toric, which is also a very good lens, is almost three times more than compared to Alcon toric. Uh, when it comes to a rotation of more than 10 degrees, uh, obviously that will deteriorate the quality of vision quite significantly. That's the, this was actually looked into very seriously by Johnson & Johnson. And that's the reason now they introduced the fact that they have roughened up their haptics so that this rotation is sort of uh, uh, arrested. This is something they uh, uh, see it happening with the toric symphony also. So this kind of, but uh, because of the stable force haptic, the design of the haptics, the Alcon toric tends to remain exactly where you left it. I think this kind of a track record, this kind of a um, uh, history is not available with our Indian toric intraocular lenses. And like we saw with the toric uh, um, thickness, you may find certain uh, problems propping up over time, which will be addressed. But it's important that uh, uh, whenever there's a significant cylinder, we go ahead and offer them. Uh, we come to the last poll question of uh, for the day. Uh, can we have it on the screen, please, uh, admins? Which is, um, what is your preferred technique for IOL access orientation for toric IOLs? I think uh, it has been beautifully shown, and we have a plethora of choices. But still, what's your favorite technique? A, is it intraoperative manual or intraoperative digital access marker? Or is it image guided technique? There's a difference between the two, which we would come to in a moment. But uh, just to tell you, sir, 100% of our respondents have uh, said that preoperative planning and workup is account. I mean, that's what they consider to be the most important factor. 100% of the respondents oh, had to say that. So your talk was pretty infectious to all of them, and it has actually created a stir wow. amongst the audience who are watching I'm you. I'm glad that you know I dwelt upon it in greater detail and rather than on the surgical aspect, because I knew all these guys would do great surgery as it is. Uh, just before I open up my presentation and go on discussing uh, this, uh, the, we'll take just one more question, and this is from my housemate, Dr. Praveen Subuddhi from Odisha, is asking, in, in the event of a posterior capsule rupture, do you still go ahead with toric or do you counsel the patient or counter counsel the patient against toric or do you explain that this is what had happened and perhaps you the putting in a toric would not be the best choice for you anymore? What do you do? I think, uh, you know, it's a problem we face once in a while. Unfortunately, there's no three-piece toric that's available, which can be, of course, their stabilization of the axis will also be a, a problem. But uh, yes, if it's a small uh, rexus, a small uh, rent in the posterior capsule, if I'm able to make it into a posterior capsule or rexus, or even if there's vitreous loss, if I'm able to implant the lens in the back, I would go ahead and, uh, and orient the lens properly. I would go ahead and uh, implant a toric and toric lens. And uh, there have been occasions where I've had a lens even running from one end to another. Uh, but at the same time, there was even a case which I've shown sometimes where I had to, the axis of orientation, the rent almost corresponded. But I'm absolutely sure and confident that there is enough capsular support and I can leave the lens behind where exactly it's meant to be. 
uh, a single piece interoculants in the bag i'll go ahead and do it this is of course depends upon the expertise confidence level and that uh, a particular surgeon's uh, um, what confidence in its own abilities but uh, in case it's a small amount of cylinder there's a large rent then maybe it will be in the interest of the patient to put a three piece lens with the optic capture and deal with the cylinder post operatively using glasses or even uh, using the laser on the cornea once the eye is stabilized so it's not about uh, toric or non toric it's about single piece or multi piece so if you're confident that you have enough integral back to put in a single piece you can you might as well go ahead and put a toric eye well as well uh, just before we uh, conclude so this session one uh, a very important thing which you made out is that don't put the single piece toric lens in the sulcus no it's right. going to rotate it's going to get malposition and it's also going to create a lot of inflammation so if you are uh, uh, going to use a toric it's in the bag because right now we have only uh, to what single piece toric lenses and since you mentioned that you uh, most often construct a, a wound size of 2.4 uh, just to ask for my knowledge do you do any customization to your irrigation factor on the pico machine do you increase it i, so I keep it at 1.4 i keep it at 1.4 you keep it at 1.4 So that's a touch uh, yeah. more than yeah. So, so the respondents have responded as intraoperative manual. So that's the majority uh, manual uh, access marker is being used by forty percent of our attendees uh, today. Uh, digital access marker is available uh, with twenty, and image guided technique also is available with forty percent. So that's quite okay. high as a number. So that's brilliant. So that gives us a cue to uh, start the next segment, which is. Uh, Uh, i would take up this <clears throat> um you've already uh, seen the role of planning to achieve precision just take a little while uh, longer Prarag, to... you should uh, introduce yourself i mean you have such a great dressing i'm sorry i mean it was not told to me is injustice at least uh, i i'm sure most of the people know you but just uh... oh, sorry uh so <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Dr. Anurag Mishra. Uh, I don't know how to introduce myself. It, it, the only line that is uh, mentioned in the slide is I'm from Odisha uh, and the eastern province of the country. I do uh, have my own practice. I have uh, two hospitals of my own uh, running in the twin cities of Katak and Bhubaneswar. Uh, I have my interest in uh, anterior segment and cataract, and I'm a trained uh, pediatric ophthalmologist and sudesmologist as well from Aravind Eye Hospital, Madurai. apart from other things i do have uh, my fitness fanaticism running along with my ophthalmic practice as well that's just about it uh, so can i begin excellent, now excellent surgeon terrific speaker and outstanding athlete go ahead and run <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much i'm blushing literally uh, i let's just that when i do work with the industry uh, but none of that uh, association has got any bias or anything to do with uh, this particular segment of Uh, talk at least the the ongoing thing that we try to achieve in terms of spectacle independence is a battle and as has been rightly pointed out right throughout this evening there are three segments if you want to win a battle you have to plan it properly then you have to execute your plan and finally perhaps you also have to analyze where you have gone wrong so you need something that is under one roof and would do the job in all these three segments simultaneously and to equal proportions we have two systems which could achieve this for us one is a markerless system which would only give you a line in the ot on the table on the i and overlay along with along which you have to align your toric iols and the other is the image guided system the difference being in the image guided system you have an excellent planning cockpit wherein you ask the patient to sit down and plan for your intraoperative and postoperative outcomes intraoperative happenings and postoperative outcomes this is one of them variant image guided system i think you have already seen bits and pieces of its attributes it's got three parts one of them is the planning cockpit this is the opd unit which sits in your opd this is the second of the configuration second of the assembly this is known as a digital marking machine or a dmm this has got two parts one is kept in the ot and if you're using a femto laser platform it, uh, the counterpart of this is also associated attached to the femto laser machine that's known as a dml 
or a DMX. The third component of this assembly sits on the eyepiece of the microscope. It's known as microscope interface device, the business end of the machine, wherein it, it, uh, uh, it corroborates all the findings that you have collected thus far and projects them onto the eye. Now let's see what it does. In the OPD unit, just like any other biometer, when you ask the patient to place his chin and forehead in the proper position, and you try to adjust the equipment to focus the light on the cornea while you're trying to adjust, three infrared lights come in from the machine and project on the cornea. What they do is they map the corneal curvature. So before the meridians are marked, before the steep and the flat meridians are marked, the corneal curvature is mapped by these three infrared lights, which take 300 scans each. Following this, when the machine comes to a focus, a single ring of 12 LED lights project on the cornea at the center, take five scans each, and they measure the steep and the flat meridian. So in the blink of eye, blink of the eye, you get 960 scans with the help of different lights to give you keratometry. So this is a dynamic variety of keratometry, perhaps one of the fewer machines in the industry which actually do that, a dynamic keratometry, and the results are very, very precise. After the keratometry is taken in the precise manner, then a digital Mendes ring is projected and is adjusted to the limbus and surrounding conjunctival vessels and their positions with respect to the meridians is mapped in the eye and then the eye is registered. So what is important here is for us to remember, not only the meridians are marked, but the conjunctival vessels and their angulations with the respective meridians are also registered, which effectively neutralizes the head tilt. So even if the patient fills his head while being examined, this position, this registration points are not going to change when you take the whole data points into the OT. Inside the OT, this is the picture on the DMM. It shows you the Mendes ring. It shows you the 12 LED lights at the center. The green cross is the center of the pupil. The white cross is the center of the LED lights and the white dot is the center of the limb. So you can get a fair bit of idea of what angle alpha and angle kappa could be, how much off should they could be from their desired values. If it doesn't give you a measurement though, you can get a fair bit of idea by looking at this picture. And it also gives you the steep and the flat meridians and the, and the point at which you wish to enter for that particular patient. Now, when you take the whole uh, registration data points into the OT and feed them into the DMM with the help of LAN or with the help of a pen drive, it already has neutralized the effect of a head tilt while you have examined the patient at the OPD unit. On the table, it also neutralizes the effect of cyclorotation. And we'll see in a moment what cyclorotation could do and what is its clinical importance. This is the picture that you get on the screen while you're trying to examine the patient. It will give you three pictures to choose from. If I just uh, 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 zoom it in, you can see that, that there is a difference between the Maya taken in the first picture and the second picture. You can see elongated points in the Maya taken in the first. You can see the points to be more regular in the second. So you have to click on the picture you wish to register for that particular patient. Then the next screen opens, which is this. You have to feed it the K1, K2, and the Y2, Y are measured by the machine. You have to feed in certain data in the next page, which is the axial length correct, uh, taken from whatever instrument you're using, the anterior chamber test, the lens thickness, and then fit in your parameters, like what is the incision size that you recommend for yourself, which is, which is the axis where you would like to enter, and where you would like your paracentesis or sideboard incisions to be. After this, the machine calculates the IL power. And of course, you have to feed in the formula that you wish, wish to use. It calculates the IL power, and then it gives you a green ribbon down below in here. What it gives in here is the exact spherical residual that this patient is likely to uh, be left with, the exact cylinder, and the spherical equivalence of that whole calculation. You get a clearer picture in the next slide. This is what it is. Barrett's is the formula we have chosen. And this is the formula, this is the IOL that has come out. It, uh, the patient does need a, a toric uh, correction, a toric IL implant, and spherical residual would be 0 0.02, cylinder would be 0 0.06, and the spherical uh, residual, uh, the spherical equivalence would be 0 0.01. So this is the picture. Now, here, this in this page, you can play around. If you wish to make the axis not at zero, 
But if it's a left eye and you wish to go slightly temporal, you can make it temporal and go to 20 or 30, wherever it is convenient. You can play around with your paracentesis incisions as well. Some people like it uh, vertical. Some people like it tangential to the plane of the primary incision. Some people like it oblique. And then, of course, the arcuate incisions come in. We'll talk about them a little later while we go to the clinical significance. <clears throat> but this is how the picture comes. Now, before you start your surgery, the entire synopsis for the patient as a final cross-check or a checklist is right in front of your eyes. This is what uh, comes into the, into the camera picture with just before you start your surgery. Everything is mentioned, the name of the patient, the eye, the incision, the sleep axis, the lens you have chosen for that particular patient. Now this shedded zone has to come and align with the limbus and then you click register when it gets registered. The machine catches the picture of the eye and compares this picture with the preoperative picture that was taken at the OPD when the patient was being examined and then matches. It is very rare for variant to register the wrong eye. Even if it's the, it's the same patient, it is extremely rare for the, uh, for the machine to register the wrong eye because it takes into account the dichromatous branching of the vessels that are around and the angle they maintain with the meridians. But it is possible, it's not absolutely impossible, but it's very, very rare. Here comes an example of cyclorotation. Now, most people would say that I do not need any machine to guide me. This is the temporal location and I enter here. But when I switch on variant, you would see that we are almost 20 degrees off axis. I'm not saying that I'm non-axis surgeon. I also do not believe in the on-axis surgery anymore after the size of the incision has been reduced to this magnitude as Dr. Namamurti was lamenting. But we will see in a moment, if you change your incision plane, then what changes? We'll see that with, with an example that I'll cite a little later. Now the MID, the microscope interface device is fitted with a very, very efficient tracker. Not all patients are the same. Some of them are really turbulent. They give you a turbulent time on the table. They move their head and the eye. Every time the eye or the head moves, the tracking device readjusts and refocuses. So you are never out of the, uh, out of the meridians. You're never out of your business area. You're never out of the bullseye, which you want to hit almost every time. So let's uh, not show you any video. Let's go to some of the clinical applications and see some interesting cases that I have encountered in my clinical practice. This is one patient who had come up and uh, who needed a toric implant. The toric that, that was chosen by the machine initially was a T3 and the spherical equivalence was 0 0.01 and the spherical power that was calculated was 24.5. Now I contacted the local distributor. Local distributor said, that we cannot give you a 24.5 T3 because it's not available with us and the patient wanted surgery on the very same day. Mind you, the 2.2 is what is the size of the incision that we have chosen. In this case, we asked Varian whether we can manage with her because the distributor told us that T2 is available with me if you should you wish to implant it, but a T2 would obviously leave the patient with more residual astigmatism. So what we did was we asked Varian whether it would be possible to implant a T2 in this particular case. Varian said, yes, you can, if you increase your incision to 2.8 and thereby induce some more amount of astigmatism. Fortunately, this patient's steep meridian was along the, uh, along the axis that we normally use to put in our incision. So 24.5 T3 left us with a 0 0.01 of spherical equivalence, 24.5 T2 also left with a 0 0.01 acceptable level of spherical equivalence. So we went ahead and implanted. This is another patient wherein the same problem happened. The patient needed a 21.5 and T5. The distributor had a 21.5, uh, did not have a 21.5 and T5, instead had a 22 and T, uh, and T5. As you can see, the spherical equivalence in here was uh, hypermetropic to the extent of 0 0.05. We asked variant whether we can put in a 22 or not. Variant showed us that the spherical equivalence was shifting mildly onto the myopic side. So it was still acceptable and was falling well within limits. So we went ahead and implanted the same. This is an old picture from an old patient where variant suggested a, a value of 15. And, so, and it showed us that it is likely to leave us with a plus 2.16 residual spherical error. We wondered why the machine has recommended this. The answer came here. The patient needed a toric implant and his residual astigmatism was supposed to be around minus four. 
So the machine calculated the spherical equivalence. As you can see, this equation would lead you to a spherical equivalence close to zero. If you're using any other optical diameter that does not calculate the spherical equivalence and only calculates the absolute residual spherical error, perhaps it would not give you a recommendation of plus 15 to be put in this particular case. The 700 also gives you a plus 15 and gives us a spherical equivalence of 0 0.01, but it does not tell us how did it calculate to reach that, that particular level. So that's where Varian is helpful. This is another patient uh, who needed, uh, who, who, whom we calculated uh, and needed a, a, a toric IOL uh, of, uh, sorry, this is a multifocal IOL. The multifocal, uh, this patient needed a multifocal toric IOL as a matter of fact, uh, but we did not have the services of a multifocal toric IOL. Instead, we uh, we asked Varian whether we can go ahead and correct this residual astigmatism with the help of uh, arcuate incisions. As you can see, there are two arcuate incisions uh, in, in here, which has been planned in a pair. The diameter with where it has been planned is nine millimeters, and the uh, span length is 22 degrees with 152 and 332 being at the central zones. Uh, we did an, uh, an eye test, of course, as you should be doing, as Dr. Amhut is lamenting a few moments back, uh, to see the angle alpha, and it is pretty much acceptable for a trifocal IOL and its central bullseye. So we went ahead and did a femto, since we had the, the patient agreeing for a femto in this case, and uh, um, and we went ahead and uh, could correct the residual astigmatism as well. But the interesting thing to note here is, Varian will tell you that if you have the spanning length of a particular arcuate incision to be X amount, it usually does not allow you to create your primary incision within 30 degrees of the lateral boundary of the arcuate incision. I, I was very fascinated by Dr. Ramamurti's example of uh, placing the arcuate incision right on top of the primary incision and still getting good results. But normally when you plan it, as you can see here in the uh, arcuate incisions are being created. Now we go to the primary incision. You can see that it's well away from the uh, this arcuate incision, at least spaced by 30 degrees. You can construct the side port incisions, of course, much closer to that. The machine does allow, but the primary incision, it always spaces a little farther off from the lateral horn of the arcuate incision. This is another example wherein the patient had a residual astigmatism of uh, plus 5.04. That's where the that's what the delta amounted to. We planned for a T9, but even then the patient was left with a fair bit of astigmatism, residual 0.86. So we asked the machine, can we plan an arcuate incision for this patient as well, since he was uh, willing to take up uh, FLAX as his platform of choice. So the machine said, yes. The only thing that was different in here was we were correcting less amount of astigmatism, uh, more amount of astigmatism. So the uh, arc length was 24 degrees as opposed to 22 in the last case. And depending on the steep meridian, the uh, central for, uh, uh, meridian also changed for, to 20 degrees and 200 degrees in this particular patient. This is a patient who needed an, uh, needed an expand. Uh, sorry, this is a patient who, with whom we pl uh, planned with, uh, for whom we planned with Varian. As you can see, when the uh, incision axis, the primary incision is set at zero, this is the left eye. When it is set at zero, the machine recommends a T3. But if you shift the incision, if you wish to shift the incision to 20 degrees, which is perhaps a more comfortable location for the left eye, the recommendation of the machine changes from T3 to T4. So this is the effect of cyclorotation. If you're off axis in placing the primary incision, you might not be an on axis surgeon, but it does have a role to play. And in certain locations, I'm not saying it happens every day or with every patient, but in certain patients, this is likely to happen, so you have to bear it in mind while you plan for a toric IOL in such patients. This is uh, this is another example of another patient who needed an expand. It was a very high myopic. Of course, the posterior pole looked pretty okay. He needed a three diopters, and you don't have uh, uh, toric lenses available in that range. So we asked, uh, uh, and it is an expand lens, so you have to plan something with a 2.8 millimeter section because uh, expands, as you know, are uh, uh, our multi-piece platforms. So the machine told us that we can also manage this with uh, two arcuate incisions placed at uh, 20, I and mean, the span length of 27 degrees at both ends uh, and the central points with 148 and 328. Once again, the lateral horn of the uh, arcuate incision was separated from the primary incision by 30 degrees or a little more than that. After 
uh, we implant in the section. This is the post-operative uh, picture, post-operative refraction results from the Furokta screen. As you can see, both eyes are pseudophagic, but this eye did not have the services of arcuate incision, so it is left with a 1.5 cylinder, though the sphericals have been neutralized very effectively in both eyes. But this is the left eye, and uh, the, the uh, AR result is not showing much, and the acceptance was zero, both on cylinder and spherical platform. The patient is doing very well uh, post-operatively. We see another foropter picture of another patient. This is, uh, this is very interesting. The right eye was to be operated, and you can see the manifest refraction amounts to this. The auto refractometer also matches the results of this. But when we see uh, the results of the keratometry after subjecting him to both Islemaster 700 and Varian, we hardly see any cylindrical error being there. 0 0.3 as depicted by Varian, and the Islemaster 700 does not show us any delta value at all. 43.75 on either axis. We wanted to know the phenomenon, why it happens, and subjected the patient to eye trace. Here we can see that the higher order aberrations are not at all increased on the corneal plane, but they are increased in the internal plane, making the total uh, higher order aberrations high. There's another interesting feature of eye trace. It calculates the refraction, which it calls the tracy refraction, right on the anterior lens capsule beyond the pupillary plane. So you can see the tracy refraction is abnormal. The manifest refraction was also abnormal, 1.5 and 1.75, but there was no toricity on the cornea. Dr. Ramurthy was speaking about it. This toricity is coming from the lens. The lens can have a lenticular astigmatism without any tilt, but if the higher order aberrations are greatly increased on the internal pain, always bear the factor of a lens tilt in mind so these might not be very good candidates. Even if you stabilize the capture bag with CTRs and otherwise, this might not be very good candidates to, these are not all very uh, very good candidates at all uh, because the corneal toricity is, is nothing, there's nothing there to neutralize on the corneal pain. So this is how you align the uh, toric IOL. Uh, we have seen this at length. Uh, the central axis of alignment sits right at the center. It's 97 degrees. And if you're using a marketless system and you're trying to implant it along 97, 97 is what it will be. It will neither be 98 nor will be 96. There is a tram line that is projected on the cornea. Um, there's a tram line and it is spaced apart by 10 degrees on either side just to give you a value. But if you wish, it can sit right at the center of the tram line to give you very accurate results. Small pupil alignments are also pretty easy, as uh, has been shown by uh, Dr. Ramurthy again. You just have to detract with either of the two instruments. Since there is a continuous running line which runs from limbus to limbus, it is uh, actually a touch easier to align the marks against the lines projected if you have the, the markerless system in the OT. Now, this is an example of parallax. We hear about it, we talk about it. There are incidents just because cornea is a prolate structure and the IL sits deeper inside. Any mark that is on the cornea might not completely corroborate with the marks on the IOL. So you might not completely do it. Some people suggest a technique of marking only one, uh, one uh, part of the cornea, which is usually the proximal plane. They mark the proximal plane and not the distal plane. I don't personally think it's a good idea. What I do for such cases is, if there is a parallax, and like in this case, you can never bring the IOL dots in alignment uh, uh, properly with the axis of implant. What I do is, I keep both the IOL dots on the same side of the dot and equidistant from the dots, equidistant from the line of axis of implant. That's what has worked uh, very well with in, in my humble hands. Um, this is a fake uh, customized fake ictoric IOL a uh, variant does not do much in, in uh, planning this because most of this come from, uh, come from the manufacturer in, uh, itself. But uh, I always try to reinforce the uh, uh, markerless toric axis because these are usually to be placed along 0 and 180. I just reinforce the mark along 0 and 180 before uh, going ahead and implanting this. Uh, uh, the lens unfolds in the anterior chamber, as you know, as I should, we all should be doing. And then the haptics are slowly tucked in and uh, uh, they should be corresponding to the axis that has that have been marked the right at the center of the defect in the uh, tetrapod haptics we should align them to match with the 
uh, with the marks that are there on the on the cornea. Uh, so uh, before uh, we conclude, this is another page that just before exiting uh, from the OT, you can put in this page comes in. You can put in finally uh, which was the model of the IOL. If there has been any last minute change that has been done, the incision width which you, which you have uh, which you have employed. The power of the IOL, whether there was any customization done in the last moment, uh, this all this information goes into the last page before you exit. Data entry is done. It does help you to calculate your own SIA, though it's pretty much stable after the centroid concept has come in. You can customize your A constant as well if you wish to. But uh, uh, talking about me, after I started using Barrett's as a routine formula, I've stopped uh, customizing my IOL constant completely. Uh, so they just help you refine the outcomes. They just help you perfecting what is already precise in your practice. So just putting up a smile behind the mask, a broad grin behind the mask when you're operating inside the OT, you know that you have promised the patient something, the best of the outcomes in terms of the refractive outcome postoperatively, and that's what this machine uh, gives you to accomplish. So ladies and gentlemen, I sign off on this note. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay home. Corona Muskar from a distance, and thank you so much for the patience exhibited uh, for the day. I'm sorry I was uh, out of action for some time, and I don't know whether there are uh, questions. I would just, uh, uh, Dr. Ramurthy, before we take, uh, if there are any more questions before we take them, uh, can we have your inputs on uh, the image guided system and? Uh, Excellent presentation, Arag. I mean, you really comprehensively covered it and you have a great understanding of the subject. I learned a lot. And before we go on to the discussion, just your point about, you know, my incision and uh, arcuate keratotomy being very close to each other. Actually, I do LRCS quite a bit, but I don't do my incisions using the laser. I somehow okay. use it for capsular excess fragmentation and uh, arcuates. But... Uh, I like to do a little limbal incision. So go ahead and use a diamond knife for making my incisions. That's the reason I'm able to combine the two. I know that uh, many of the platforms don't allow the aqueous to come very close. And initially I had uh, concerns that, you know, it might go through that, but it's, uh, I find that I'm able to titrate in such a way that it goes under that. And, uh, no, but before you plan your uh, LRIs, I've been uh, meaning to ask this for quite some time. Do you actually look at the pachymetry in that particular area? Uh, you know, uh, yes. I mean, you know, uh, I use a 600 micron guarded knife. And uh, twice uh, I have had a through and through incision coming up. But otherwise, I have not had a problem. And most often topography is there. To be frank, I don't look at it. But my... Junior colleagues have a look and warn me if there is something, but most often there's enough uh, uh, depth in that area. But having said that, the hundreds of LRIs being done, twice I have had a, a through and through perforation and fortunately it didn't lead into a any kind of complication. But it would be a good idea to make sure because there we are using just a guarded knife of 600 microns. Yes, but uh, uh, sir, we, I think uh, to the best of my understanding, I mean, we also plan the arcuate incisions uh, in the nine millimeter zone. Uh, but most of the uh, you are talking about laser arcuate keratotomy or uh, LRIs. I'm talking about the arcuate incisions done by laser. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So we do it at the nine millimeter zone. Hmm. But uh, when we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the the topographers, they normally do not expand up to that zone. I mean. Up to eight millimeters is what they give us a comfortable value. Beyond that, uh, it's a little. I mean, even they say that we might not be very accurate in giving you the pachymetric values through peripheral. So, uh, actually, I'm doing my arcuates at eight, at eight millimeters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, right. I think the Donnan field nomogram and other things also take eight millimeter because the more closer to the center you are, the better is the effect. And. Uh, it in fact, somebody was uh, asking about your nomograms at the initial part of our discussion. So let me take that. Dr. Mansi actually wishes to know that uh, which nomogram do you zero in on while you plan your LRIs? Uh, basically, I go with the Varion. You know, feed in all the data and you extensively covered it. And uh, that gives me as to what should be the size of my uh, um, LRIs that needs to be made. I think as far as the intraocular lens power calculation, the toricity it uses the uh, right now, the Barrett, uh, as far as the 
uh, LRI is a concern. I think it's based on donor fee. So I have uh, one of my hospitals. I have a uh, catalyst, but even there uh, with the lensex, of course, it, there's automatic transmission. But even there, I go with the very own uh, calculation of the uh, length of my incisions and uh, go by go with that. So there was a generalized consensus uh, uh, among certain people, and and some of them are quite uh, authoritative in their subjects. And they say that if you have multiple equipment, say we, if we say for example, we have an Iron Mask 700 and a variant, both of them calculate the keratometric values. So it is it is sometimes advocated for that you do not extrapolate one keratometric value to the other and try to calculate that. Even if you think variance keratometry is more accurate, do not calculate the ILPAR based on uh, uh, the keratometric readings from Varian and axiometric readings from uh, 700. Your opinion on that? No, you're absolutely right. You know, it's uh, like uh, taking magnitude from one and axis from the other is like uh, combining apples and oranges. So it's essentially, it's important that uh, we go with one. I, by and large, go with the I will master 700 as far as my intraocular lens implantation is concerned. And uh, you know, the, both the toricity and the axis. So that's what is uh, fed into the machine and I go with that. I'm quite comfortable and getting reasonably good results. This is where something like Aura might come into play, where you know you can do a uh, on-table abrometry and decide on the exact uh, um, orientation, but that comes at a considerable price. But as of now, as you said, that uh, stick to one machine. But occasionally we have this dilemma of uh, pre-operatively, for example, your manual keratometer, your uh, IOL master and your pentacam might give you different readings. In these cases, again, Barrett comes to our rescue where you can feed in this data and it uh, throws out the outliers and gives you a median value. And it's actually Barrett, the Graham Barrett recommends that you take from three instruments and feed it in. And that way they, he says that uh, less than 0.5 diopters of uh, uh, would be more than in 92% of cases. So yes. it might be a good idea to even more than getting confused. If you're, if you're sure that the input of the, the quality of uh, measurements that you're getting from all three instruments are quite good, you can use this formula to exactly land at the median. And uh, that might be the way to go. Yeah, so that answers Dr. Prakhar Goel's question who uh, wanted to know which additional instruments are required to calculate power and access of a toric I think uh, Dr. Ramurti, during the course of his uh, lecture, also had uh, uh, had uh, lamented on this. You do not need, I mean, the optical biometry is as fantastic an equipment as it is. It is definitely not a game changer. You do, it's not a must-have uh, in your uh, sure. clinic uh, for you to start a toric. You can jolly well start, but uh, provided the optometrist or whoever is calculating uh, the, uh, the parameters of the eye, uh, should do a reasonably good job with the whatever instruments you have in hand. And if there is any scope of you uh, with you to graduate onto the next level and uh, procure an optical biometry, that's always the way to go. Oh, right? I, so, I, no, yeah. I would, I think it's a very, very important point you made, uh, Anurag. I mean, you know, because I saw this. Uh, mindset even in some of my own colleagues, you know, who are working in some of our smaller centers where we did not have an optical biometer. They thought they need all this, they need a Varion, they need an optical biometer before they can start doing this. But if you have a good biometrist or you yourself are doing it, getting good repeatable optical, what the immersion biometry readings, as well as good manual keratometer readings, using the right formula, you can get started. I think using to do, uh, prescribing toric IOLs is like prescribing cylinder in your glasses. So all of us should uh, uh, go on to that mindset and start using these lenses. And as you use them, these are fairly uh, what small differences, even though we talk every one degree makes a 3% difference and all. We find that even if they, you land up the patient within 0.5 points, the doctors of correction, most often they are quite happy. So please go ahead and start it. Start uh, using these lenses, whichever company you want to. You will find that you end up with uh, happier patients. And what would your advice be to uh, this small section? I think this, like, that section is reasonably small now. Who are not into toricals at all. I mean, the degrees may vary, but I think everybody is using them now. 
so if somebody wishes to go to that i mean has not reached that uh, stage that bracket as yet and wishes to go there would you recommend uh, to start with would you recommend higher toricity to be corrected initially or lower toricity to be corrected initially so that the surgeon does not feel disheartened with his post operative outcomes what would your suggestion to that would, aspiring surgeon be i would like them to take a middle path you know what happens is if you are trying to correct a 0.75 diopters of cylinder and you leave behind 0.5 diopters even though the patient might accept it the surgeon especially in his initial days might feel extremely disappointed because he will feel that this lens really didn't do anything to my patient he has almost the same cylinder which he started out with at the same time if he does a t9 and is off axis by 5 degrees then uh, that would be a significant amount of cylinder that's left over almost a diopter adapter and a half which would require external glasses but if you use a t4 t5 initially and even though you might uh, have a small uh, um, uh, you know the orientation is not as perfect as you would like it to be you would be left behind with a smaller amount of cylinder but at the same time both the surgeon and the patient would have benefited significantly from it so how frequently uh, uh, would you recommend or would you use or do you use in your experience toric avals in uh, post laser vision correction patients i mean what do you look at what are the parameters that you judge the candidature of a particular patient to receive toric avals in post lvc patients see uh, i would look at this uh, first of all the comfort level of the patient the patient was very happy with his glasses i mean you know without the glasses or with his glasses obviously they may be because you have big power they said that i was having 66 and 6 vision and very comfortable and they were very happy uh, with the refractive outcome after the lasik treatment you know that again would tell me that uh, this uh, this is a fairly regular cornea and i would like to have a look at the topography it should be a sea of green, uh, uniform green you know if there are a lot of aberrations i look at my uh, uh, eye trace there are quite a bit of uh, a coma and trefoil these are not cases which should do well with premium intraocular lenses so if it's a fairly regular cornea and the toricity as i said is fairly orthogonal that is and the treatment is well centered uh, these are the features that i would look for in these cases i would go ahead and use a toric intraocular lens if the patient has been happy with his glasses he is likely to be happy with his toric lenses if the patient needed a contact lens for his correction and was not happy with the quality of vision uh, the toric lens may not serve him well Oh, that's i think a very very important practical point i think uh, uh, right so i think so we are not left with any more question or any other, uh, other discussion pointers to uh, finish off with i think we have just overshot the time that was allotted to us by 10 minutes so that's fair enough uh, we have had an excellent session we have had a great evening i think of learning and discussing and knowing things uh, um Mr. Samir, would uh, anybody from uh, Alcon like to uh, propose a vote of thanks to Dr. Ram Murthy, or should the moderator do it? Because uh, I am always thankful to him for uh, posing as a great teacher to me. I have really enjoyed his company wherever we have been together. His talks are uh, I mean, fantastic, fantabulous. You 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 short of words when you describe the way he uh, presents his. I mean, that's the in-depth perception he has about his subject. So, uh, would you like to do it, Mr. Anurag? I mean, that's very generous of you, but I mean, you are no pushover. I mean, that's excellent examples. I really learnt a lot and enjoyed your talk. Uh, let's keep in touch. <laughs> sure, certainly, it would be my honour to stay in touch with you, sir. Mr. Samir, should we wrap up? All right. So, uh, right. Thank you so much. So we've got the queue. Uh, thank you so much. We look forward to your generous company once again, uh, Ramamurthy sir. And uh, thank you so much, Alcon, for organizing this platform and this uh, webinar here tonight. I think all of us had more than plenty to learn, and I'm sure the feedback that you collect later on from the attendees would be as good and would be uh, very, very uh, realistic and very pleasing. to all of you thank you so much the back end office you did a great job in uh, putting things together and uh, 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 mounts of uh, uh, gratitude to dr ram murthy to spare some of his precious time with all of us and uh, letting us go through this uh, whole enigma on uh, uncode the helix as i call it 
of uh, astigmatism correction during cataract surgery. So thank you so much. Uh, that's where we conclude and uh, that's it. Thank you, Alcon. Thank you, Anurag.